Hi, welcome to um, our Summer Pan podcast. Today we've got a special guest, Dr. Azar, uh, who works in our outpatient uh, services here in, in Mumbai. And uh, we're going to get to know Dr. Azar a little bit better. And I thought maybe uh, you'd like to just introduce yourself for a moment, Azar. Okay, I guess I can. Uh, my name is Dr. Azar Hakim. Uh, I'm a medical doctor, I'm a clinical psychologist, uh, and I'm also a recovering alcoholic and addict. Fantastic. So, I mean, a lot of people would want to know is like, hey, he's a medical doctor, he's sat here in his chair, he's talking about being uh, a recovering addict. So, so maybe, um, as well, maybe you'd like to just share a little bit about your journey to what has actually got you sat in this, in this chair at this moment in time. You know, the funny thing, right? Um, that was the same question I asked myself some 30 odd years ago. How can I be an alcoholic or an addict? I'm a medical doctor. I've studied about this stuff. This can't possibly happen to me. Um, but it did, right? So I realized that addiction is an equal opportunity employer. It doesn't make a difference, caste, creed, intelligence, gender. Uh, it can affect anybody just like any other medical disease can. Of course, I'm saying that a lot simply right now, but I was struggling with this <laughs> early. That wasn't the easy way at the no, beginning. No, uh, I resisted it, right? Um, when it was suggested to be by my family members and my place of work that I might have a problem with alcohol, I was not willing to accept it. Um, they suggested I go to 12-step meetings. I went there and I said, nope, I'm not that bad. Uh, uh, this is not me. And I think I went through all those five stages, right? It took me, it took me a little while uh, to come to terms with the fact that I indeed do have an addiction. Um, and it was, you know, the first stage. I don't have a problem. You guys are all idiots, you know. <laughs> that was step stage one. Uh, and stage two was, well, maybe I do have a problem, but I just need to cut down. I don't need to stop. And then stage three was, uh, well, yeah, maybe I need to stop, but I don't need anybody's help. I can do this on my own. And then it went to, well, maybe I need somebody's help, but I'm not going to listen to everything they say. Right? And then finally it was, okay, I'm done. <laughs> I need help. I'm putting my hands up. <laughs> you guys tell me what to do and I'm ready. But that was a journey, yeah. right? Um, and I, I went through a lot of the stuff, you know, my, just to go back, the drinking and the using of substances started out like the vast majority of people. It was fun for a period of time, it was recreational, I did a lot of it. I enjoyed doing it, it made me feel popular, it made me feel confident. Um, but that was the initial four or five years. And then I was the person who was drinking more, drinking longer carrying booze back home after the party and it became to a point in which I was drinking every day um, and then on the weekends it would creep up during the whole day and um, there was a cocktail of other substances going along with it uh, um, and it took it took a lot of losses in terms of relationships and friendships uh, in terms of my health in terms of my career um, there was a they say the recovery programs are free. I think I paid a very heavy price <laughs> to get admission Nothing in there. Nothing is free, is Nothing what is free. Say, yeah. is um, But yeah, that's in a nutshell. I could go into further detail if you want about any specific thing, but that's in a nutshell. It, it, took, it took five years of fun drinking, another 10 years of not so fun drinking, and another five years to get myself to admit that I was an alcoholic or an addict. Just, I mean, one of the things that you talked about being a, a medical doctor, and I was sort of, sort of thinking, well, you know, everyone always looks at doctors, and they're the people that are probably the, the smartest people in the room. They're the people that everyone looks to for advice. Um, you know, what was, you know, I mean, talking about the medical profession, and I mean, I come from, I'm a nurse by 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 training, so I'm pretty sort of aware of that. You know, there's problematic drinking and substance use going on within the sort of the healthcare field but what you know what, what would you say in and in particular in India you know I'd be really interested to hear what you sort of say or what you've recognized in in, in terms of this well what I recognize was well, to say yes I'm smart and I gave a lot of advice the problem was I couldn't apply any of that to myself uh, but the medical profession is honored is revered but at the end of the day it's like any other career right um, you can see addiction in Every career, whether you're a celebrity actor, whether you're in the financial services, whether you're a lawyer, or whether you're a doctor, it's just another profession. 
um, the idea that you're a doctor and therefore cannot be afflicted by addiction is like saying you're a doctor and therefore you can't have diabetes. <laughs> so, uh, medical professionals can de dis um, develop all kinds of med medic disorders. Uh, the trick is how well do you implement your own therapies? Right? So, so similarly, if I, if I develop diabetes, I may be a medical doctor. If I don't follow the protocols of recovery, I may have 17 degrees on my wall. It's not really going to help. I may be very smart. I may be able to advise people yes. on how to recover from diabetes, yes. but I may not do that myself. Um, and the same thing applies for addiction. And, and what about, you know, for, for doctors, I mean, uh, I mean, I've seen quite a lot of doctors over the years as a, as a, as a therapist, and I'm sure, sure you have as well, you know, and, 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 and what, what do you see as their struggles in sometimes accessing help? Because I think that sometimes is quite problematic. Yeah, it is problematic uh, uh, because there is a reputation that precedes you, right? Uh, and you have a responsibility for the care of other people. Uh, so to acknowledge to yourself uh, is hard enough. Uh, you're always worried that the impact that it's going to have on your profession, right? If you come out and talk openly about the fact that you're struggling, uh, you worry that it may damage your career, the confidence your patients have in you. And so there is this inbuilt re reluctance to own up to any of it. Uh, and it exists and it's hidden. I've got friends in the medical profession uh, other than me who've struggled with this. Um, and the recovery becomes a little more trickier because it becomes that much more difficult to share openly yes. because of the feared consequences. But uh, one of the things is if you have a good therapist and if you have a good treatment program where they value confidentiality, that makes all the difference. Yeah. yeah, I'm assuming that, you know, for a lot of people, as you say, the reputation, the yeah. reputation, the sort of, you know, the, 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 the shame, the embarrassment that mm -hmm. all, always goes with anyone yeah. that's struggling yeah. with substance abuse mm -hmm. is probably even more magnified yeah. for people that are in a, you know, maybe sort of a hospital manager or an eminent surgeon mm -hmm. or whatever it might yeah, be. Yeah, and particularly if you're in the surgical fields, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, people are entrusting you with their lives. Yes. Right, and this whole idea that, okay, you have a drinking problem or even had a drinking problem can undermine the trust of a lot of people. Yeah. Um, but that's why confidentiality in, in your treatment center or in your treatment care services is pivotal. If, as a doctor, as a clinician, if I feel assured of that, yes. it becomes that much more easier. Yeah, for me to embark on this journey. Can I, can I ask? Because I mean, it's sort of it's always been an interesting question for me as a therapist, and probably also you know you, you you're a therapist, but you're also a doctor, so mm. you, and you've been sat in both seats. Yeah. So you know what 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 is it like, sort of you know all of a sudden being sat in that other seat, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the seat where you're no longer in sort of you're oh, no longer brother. in control. That, that was hard, right? That was hard. So I'm, 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 I was a guy who was used to being advice to my patients, right? Yeah. And to take that hat off and to say, wait a minute, you're the patient. Yeah. Right? And then you have this ego, right, that goes along with the fact that you're a medical doctor and, sure. you know, and intelligent or whatsoever else. Uh, and that can be a big barrier. So it, it, it requires a certain degree of vulnerability and a certain degree of Humility is too strong a word, but at least a step in that direction, right? Yeah. Uh, it's about accepting that, yes. Uh, and I had to keep going back to the other medical uh, comparisons, right? If I was diabetic or if I had arthritis or if I required surgery for something, I would visit a practitioner yeah. from the perspective of a patient. Yes. Right? Uh, and I had to remind myself that's the same thing you have to do over here. Right? Um, uh, but that wasn't always easy because then I can get into intellectual conversations about the modalities of treatment mm -hmm. uh, and try to impress my doctor that I also know stuff. Yes. Uh, forgetting that what I'm there for is a different thing. I'm there yes. to get help and to figure out how to implement that help in my life. Um, but that was a struggle. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, one of the things that I, I sort of that sometimes I find interesting, and it's not just about doctors, but you know, when 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 any sort of client comes in, that often that sometimes they feel that they know better than yeah. than 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 the therapist, mm -hmm. or they feel they know better than maybe all the all their peers in their room. Yeah. They feel that they feel different. Yeah, yeah. So all of that, yeah. all of that, right? Um, because of my education and because yeah. of the successes that I had until then, um, there was a certain ego that came along with that, and it became. It became hard. In fact, it was one of the biggest stumbling blocks in my recovery process in which um, 
I, I would rather have discussions with you rather than seek help from you, right? I mean, I have all this knowledge and I've studied it. Yeah. Um, and I know how addiction works. Uh, and then I want to have these intellectual conversations about new emerging treatments. Yes. Without trying to implement the basics. Yes. Um, but a good therapist, right? Um, a good counselor can really help you through that, right? A good counselor will call you on that as it's happening. Yes. Right? Well, it was pointed out to me that, you know, Azar, do you think you're actually intellectualizing the problem? Yeah. Uh, it was just stated very clear to me as a possibility that was occurring and with if I wanted to look at it. And it was those kind of nudges that would yes. kind of make me come back to my side of the street. Yeah. And every now and then again, when I would cross over, the therapist would tell me, okay, you got to take the doctor off hand. You're telling me off here. Get out of here and come down here. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. And I resisted, right? I resisted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and for you, I mean, you know, I mean, you went, went to, I mean, what was your first experience or what was it like going into rehab? I mean, you know, that whole... Wow, yeah. You know I mean? Because um, a lot of people, maybe people that are watching this now are sort of maybe looking at this and thinking, well, you know, I've got a loved one or I've got a, you know, or maybe myself, and mm -hmm. but I'm not really sure mm -hmm. um, what, what's the kind of So I had a lot of misconceptions about what rehab was, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm from the medical field, right? Yes. Um, and sure, there are some crappy rehabs that exist, uh, but, but my whole picture of rehab was that it's this draconian, dark place where they tie you up and they give you electric shocks and you have no freedom and they humiliate you and they make you do menial chores. And yes. That was the impression that I had of rehab. Um, and uh, what I learned was it's really nothing like that. As long as you pick a good rehab, mm -hmm. a rehab is like a hospital, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's run by a team of professionals. Uh, yes. Uh, it's got a clinical program of recovery. They've got people, the multidisciplinary staff that do various different things. Um, and after the first period of settling in, it actually turned out to be a great experience. Yes. Uh, because, I mean, I resisted it. First, there was disbelief, right? I'm going to rehab. I really can't believe this. Yeah. And the first couple of days, oh my God, where have I landed up? Like, well, where am I getting I, out? <laughs> where am I getting out? Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Counting down the days. Yeah. Uh, and then you meet people who are in the same process as you are. Uh, you, you know, um, you, hopefully, you have a good treatment team. Yes. You start doing groups. You start doing the individual counseling sessions. And that really starts to help. Yeah. Um, and I remember three weeks into the program, I was feeling so safe there that I was scared to come out. Um, but uh, it was nothing like what I thought it to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, one of the, I mean, one of the things that sort of like I want to ask is, I mean, you really are the sort of the driving forces of like Samapan. So you know. Um, Obviously, I work for Samapan as well, but I came in a little bit later. You're sort of the the person that probably started really the vision, mm. with, along with with um, with the Baldotta family and and stuff. But mm. what is it that you sort of feel that you know? What what do you see sort of Samapan developing into, and and what has it been been like for you over the last couple of years? I mean, we had that horrible interruption with with COVID as well. Yeah, but yeah, you know what yeah. what. You know, what's that been like for you? So, um, thanks. Thank you for asking that question, right? Uh, because, so, you know, I got clean, I got sober, I went abroad, I got my master's degree, and I stayed back in the U.S. for about eight or nine years, uh, where I was working in rehabs. Yes. And then 2010, I came back to India, and I set up a little private practice. Um, and I was really taken aback uh, at that time with the quality of rehab centers and treatment in India. Yes. Um, and I was finding it hard to find a place that I could send people. Um, and slowly this whole idea of, you know, we need to be doing treatment differently in India mm. was sort of been kicking around in my head for a period of time. I really wanted to be able to contribute something back in this field. Um, and then I met up with the Baldota family and they were very eager and they were very invested in doing something together. So. I think it was the right time, it was the right place, the forces aligned and we sat down together and this whole idea emerged uh, that India is developing and advancing in so many areas. We're becoming yes. a world player yep. in various, various different domains, right? And it was felt like we should be there for addiction and yep. mental health, right? Yep. We shouldn't have to seek services outside of our country. There has to be a standard of care, yes, right, that needs to be established. Yes. Uh, and Samarpan was sort of uh, envisioned as 
a step to address that problem. We are under no illusions that we're going to, you know, transform the country with our initiatives. It's a big country. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is we need to start raising awareness yeah. and re just start raising the standard of care that is there, right? And so the idea of building, the idea was wraparound services. Yes. Uh, in which you have a pre-treatment component because as you know, as I know from my own life, right? Yes, of course. Uh, quite often the family members will approach you first. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely my experience in India yeah, is that right. more often than not, probably, probably 80% of the people the time, yeah. come through. It's not necessarily the, the, the person that's struggling. Um, it's normally a family member first. Yeah. yeah, right. And so there's a whole engagement process in which you strategize with the family, you use the evidence base. We, we use stuff that we know works. Yes. How, do you, how do you engage the person who's reluctant to come into care, right? We guide the family on that. And we start off with what we call pre-treatment. We engage the person in counseling services and we plug them into groups or group counseling. And a percentage of them do well yes. with that. Um, but if that doesn't work, then the next step becomes an, in an intensive outpatient program or a rehab program. Yes. The intensive outpatient program is okay. There are, there are, so what we do at the beginning is, right, we do an assessment yeah. uh, and to figure out what level of care this person requires. Um, rehab quite often is the best option because by the time people come to seek help, the disease has progressed to a point in which functionality is compromised. Sure. Um, and so then we do the rehab program. If they are unable to go to rehab, we have an outpatient program. Yes. Um, and then we follow that up with aftercare for two months of individual and group and family counseling services. And the idea was, uh, when we started Samarpan, was to develop a blueprint, a pilot in the Bombay, Pune area. Yes. And then to be able to set up multiple centers yeah. across the country. Um, and the vision was to, to set a standard of care, right, um, in which we are not saying that we'll be the only centers in India, but uh, if, we, if we can set a standard of care that the medical fraternity buys into, which is evidence-based, which is certified by international accreditation organizations, then you're sort of raising the bar that everybody aspires to, and hopefully that sure. will create some kind of a transformation. Yeah. And how, how do you think it's gone over the last, I mean, you know, it's been certainly, outpatients have been open for a little bit longer than the rehab. Mm. Um, Rehab's been open for, I've got to get this right, around about nearly 18 months now, mm -hmm. isn't it? As mm -hmm. I think, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, how do you sort of see sort of how things sort of develop? So it, 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 clients coming through, you see, you know, you see a lot of the clients that, that come to you first before they come to the rehab. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. And if you don't, then you see the ones that come, come out of oh, rehab. Yeah. So. so it's been quite a journey, right? I mean, we started this, the whole idea started in the middle of COVID. So some part of me is saying you must be whacked in the head, right? But, <laughs> but, but I don't know, the stars aligned and we started, the minute the restrictions were lifted, we started the outpatient services. Yes. And I, I got to say, it's, it's the, the, I mean, we are getting around 50 to 60 new people every month coming into the outpatient center. Yes. Right. Uh, and that number has been increasing gradually. We are hiring more counselors. So the footfalls are happening. Yes. Um, uh, as the rehab center, the aftercare. So what we are seeing is now it's, uh, that people are, uh, are beginning to realize that there is a center. Yeah. For care, uh, people uh, either people or their families are coming directly to us, and we are able to engage them. Uh, there's a word of mouth that's happening in the medical fraternity with yes. the psychologists and with the clients themselves. Yes, um, and the numbers are swelling, right? Um, we are we're getting more patients in the outpatient program. We're getting more patients in the rehab yes. program, um, and most hearteningly we are able to retain them in aftercare. Yes. Right? I yeah. think that makes all the difference because the first two, three months when you come out of rehab, that's really tricky yeah. and we are able to engage them. Uh, so, what's the phrase? Cautiously optimistic? Yeah. That yeah. we are headed in the right direction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's quite cool today. I mean, I'm here in Mumbai, come down from Pune, so, mm. yeah. um, you know, as, as, as you know, sort of there's quite a few <laughs> Quite a few of our sort of alumni sort of yeah. here this morning for a, yeah. for a meeting and it was like really, it was really... Yeah, so that must have been great for you, yeah. right? Because there were a couple of them who were with you in January at yes. the centre. Yes. And then to see them in group and, you know, eight, yes. nine months sober, clean, yes. yeah. with that smile, with that laughter. Yeah, and looking completely different yeah. to yeah. how they... I really, at the end of the day, that's what makes it worthwhile, <laughs> right? That really makes it worthwhile. Yeah, you yeah. know, yeah. it was really good to see. I mean, just interestingly, I mean, one of the things that you mentioned, or people before, having to go overseas mm -hmm. um, for treatment yeah. and, you know as, as you as you know I can't I you know I'd worked in mm -hmm. in Thailand for many years mm -hmm. as a um, you know running centers there and 
we used to see a lot of Indian right. Indian nationals coming over to Thailand. You know, mm -hmm. I think Thailand was you know geographically very close. Right. So, I, I, I sent a bunch of people to. Yeah. I may have sent people to you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I mean that is just part and parcel. You know, most of the yeah. people there who could afford it, I would tell them if you can afford it, please seek treatment outside. You know. And, yeah. And, Sorry, what you were saying, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, we're talking about that, but you know, now sort of we've got we've got a rehab here in in, in India, sort of you know, in, in Pune, in Mulshi. Mm -hmm. um, you know what? You know, for, for for people that are looking at rehab, what what was your what's your take on that now? There's not so much need, is there, really? To, to no, go no, 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 absolutely the, not. Right. So right now, I mean, that, that was one of the main reasons that Samarpan came into existence, right? Yeah. That, 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 there was this idea with the Baldota family that no Indian should have to go abroad yes. uh, for treatment, for quality care. That was one of the guiding principles. Yes. And you know, I mean, you know better. We're getting people from abroad coming in now to our rehab. You, we, you've had people from the U.S., from the U.K. Yes. I yeah. think there's somebody is coming in next month. We've had people from Nigeria. We've had people from all Switzerland. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we've had so, a, a raft of people yeah. sort of from all over. So absolutely, you know. So uh, and uh, primarily as a clinician, you know, even if I wasn't part of Samarpan, just to, just to see the program and the way it's evolved and emerged. As a clinician, as a physician, as a therapist, I feel supremely comfortable. Yes. That I'm in a position right now that I can tell the families, you know what, we have a place now in India. You don't need yeah. to worry. You don't have to spend that exorbitant amount of money. Yes. You know, and then a family member generally has to go with them. And it's so disruptive sending somebody abroad. And yeah. now with all the visas and all the you know other nonsense that's going along with it, that we're finally in a place in which we can say, okay, we've got a center in India. Yeah. That is evidence-based, that is professional. Uh, that has got a team of qualified people running it and with fabulous clinical programming. I mean, I, you know, I think one of the things for me, and, I, and, and I'm sure that you, you, you can probably elaborate a little bit about this, is that, you know, particularly working with Indian clients, there is, you know, there is some sort of, you know, cultural nuances yeah. that probably, you know, realistically, we're probably going to be more adept at working with yeah. here than, than maybe overseas. You know, so, I mean, the, could you explain maybe some of the, those sort of cultural nuances that really sort of are really important and that goes for not just the rehab but also for, for the outpatient mm -hmm. and, and everything that we do here. You know, in that, that's well. really a great question. You know, when I was sending people abroad for treatment, the consistent complaint that I would get when they came back is, doc, they don't get the culture, right? Um, and the really important thing to understand, right, at the heart of Indian society is family. Yes. And when we say family, we don't mean nuclear family. <laughs> we mean 13 uncles and 15 cousins and everybody has a say in your life. I've had six cars turn up. <laughs> you had six cars turn up. <laughs> <laughs> to bring one person in, you know. Yeah. And they were full. <laughs> so we are the kind of people, if my brother's gone to study in the US and he's coming back after six months, 20 of us will land up at the airport to pick him up. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's India. That, that. And family is at the heart of it, right? Um, and uh, so to engage the family as yes. allies, right? Yes. And to have that little bit of educational piece about your loved one has a disorder, he's not a bad person, he's not, this is not a moral issue, this is a medical sure. issue, right? Yeah. And to walk them through that process, you know, that component from the pre-treatment to while they're in rehab and the aftercare, the engaging of the family yes. is critical is absolutely critical right yes. and, and that's the nuance and and family is whosoever person that person decides is family yes right and so that could be a sibling that could be a parent that could be a child that could be the spouse that could be anyone um, uh, we invite them into the process um, we also and it's a little bit of a delicate balance right so while you want the family engaged and supportive uh, the other side of India, Indian family is that we are overly involved. Yes. Right? Yeah. So we sometimes don't understand the difference between being supportive and directive. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that whole aspect, you know, about working with the families to help them establish, here's what you can do that will be really helpful. Yes. And here's what you're doing which is probably driving your loved one a little crazy. Yes. Right? Yeah. That guidance. Yeah. Is, is critical, I think, in the Indian context, you know. Um, and I think uh, if we get that piece right, the clinical program actually is the easy part. It's manualized, it's evidence-based, yeah. you train your therapist, yes. you know, you've got a good set of therapists, they can yeah. do a smack bang job of it, right? Yes. The family part is a little messy, right? It's a little amorphous. Yes. Right? 
<laughs> so, so to get that part right, but if you get both of them right, right, if you get the individual counseling and the therapy right, yep. the, and you get the family group right, the outcomes you see are fabulous. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, you know, I mean, one of the things, um, and I'm sure, I mean, a lot of the time, as we say, people often, the first call that we get is is from family. Yeah. It's not, it's not the person. Yeah. So. So you know what would what, what what do you what would you be saying to to family members that might be having a you know a loved one work colleague that's really struggling really struggling with their you know with their their, their problematic drinking mm-hmm. or substance use whatever it might be you know what 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 would you say to them what can what can they do because it's always quite difficult, isn't it? People yeah. are a little bit, yeah. often a bit. So I, I'm thinking back to my time, right? My yeah. my parents, my my mom was beside herself to try to get me to acknowledge of or to course. get help, and I was just resistant to it, right? Yeah. Um, and what I want to tell families is that um, there is help. Yes. Right. So if your loved one has to be has, has to have a surgery, you're not expected to do the surgery. Your job yeah. is to get him to the surgeon. Yes. Right. Uh, so that's the first thing to tell families that you don't have to fix it. You have to basically get the person connected to care yes right um, yes. and we can help you with that right yes. we, over the years we've seen people with you know various kinds of blocks and obstacles yeah right so if you come and meet with us we can sit down with you understand the context of what's going on and figure out ways in which you can engage the person yeah right uh, and that generally goes into some kind of uh, format about look we are concerned and uh, we know that you don't think it's a problem or we know you don't want to get help or you want to do it on your own. Yes. All we're asking is why don't you just do one or few sessions, do an introductory thing. And you know, so we help them strategize and we help them engage the person. Uh, and while the person is going through, the, the person with the addiction problem is going through all the drama that goes along with it, we support the family. Yes. We have family groups over here, we guide them through about how to handle the situation. What we found, Namartan, is the family is guided and yeah. are consistent in their approach, right? You can engage the person. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's because what happens otherwise is the families are so frustrated that some days they can be very loving and sympathetic, and then some days you're very angry and you're frustrated, uh, right? Uh, so it's, it's just. So if if we have sort of handhold them through a consistent response to the substance use and how to manage it, yeah, we find it works wonders. I mean, I'm sure you've seen the same thing, right? Yeah. I mean, you had people come to the rehab with families being in such disarray, and yes. by the time they leave from there, you've got a unit going. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I think it's a really good point that you make about that. You know, the families, the that they often they don't necessarily know what to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can talk. And who can blame person. them, right? How, yeah. how, how, how you would have no frame of reference. Yeah, no frame. You, you don't go to school and you don't get taught about <laughs> how to deal with 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 someone that's an alcoholic or an addict or. Mm-hmm you know, that has problematic drinking or substance use or whatever it might be. Right, All these things going on and yeah. no one's taught how yeah. to, to deal and, with And then it. there's the shame and the stigma along yeah. with it, right? Yeah. Who do I tell this about? How do I even seek help and all of yeah. that, right? And so, so what we found is like, if, if you establish that connection and say, look, we're here, this is not going to happen in one session, but yeah. if, you, if you work with us, we'll figure out a way to engage your loved ones. Yeah. And you've seen that happen, I think, in the, in the last year, so many people through the rehab who've come through uh, with really reluctant to come in yes and they've come out of there in four weeks or six weeks yes and suddenly you have a plan that the family is actually stable yes yeah i mean it's sort of it's it, it, it's yeah. really interesting how you know with a little bit of support and a little yeah. bit of guidance people can start to at least put some yeah you know put some boundaries in the families and things like that yeah. i'm mindful of the time and i don't want to sort of go on too but i got asked one question a couple i got probably maybe two questions um covid Mm-hmm. All right, I, I, I can, I cannot <laughs> sit here and ask all these questions without talking about the elephant in the in the in the room yeah. that sort of you know impacted on our mm-hmm. our lives for such a long period of time. And I, and one of the reasons I go back to that was, and you probably remember this, you, when I got interviewed to to come and work in Samarpan, I was sat in. <laughs> I was yeah. in quarantine, in, quarantine. In, in, in Bangkok for 14 yeah. days. Yeah. So, you know, what, 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 I mean, COVID changed the world. It changed it for, you know, I mean, yeah. what, what do you see how it's changed? And in particular in, in our field and about the impact that, that it's had on mental health and, 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 and substance use over, you know, you know mm. particularly in India. So two broad themes, right? Um, the upside is that 
it has now become acceptable to talk about mental health in India. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were heading there, don't get yes. me wrong. There yes. was a change that was happening. Yeah. We were getting progressively there. But the pressures that COVID created, right? Um, and there was a certain degree of openness now in which people can talk about mental health without the whole bunch of stigma that goes along with it. Yeah. Um, uh, so we did, but we did, but on the other side, people who did have mental health and addiction issues got worse in COVID. Yeah. Right? It was for people who were struggling with addiction, my God, people who were barely just hanging in there when you had COVID and after the first three months, after first three months you didn't get any booze unless yes. you were really resourceful. Yeah. That's somebody who was a bar owner. Well, there's always <laughs> people. I think you know, and I know that anyone that's anyone that's got, um, so, so there was, they're pretty resourceful. <laughs> there, was, there was this guy, and you were at a restaurant, right? And the restaurant was shut, but he had a fully stocked bar. Yeah. At the restaurant, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but the vast majority of people, what they found themselves with, even though they were limiting it to the weekend and to the evening, and they were applying all kinds of pressures to keep it in control. Sure. The bottom just fell out. Yeah. Right. Uh, so you were sitting at home, and you uh, the substance use just went through the roof. Yeah. Uh, and till today, I'm still getting people that doc. I was fine till COVID. And I'm like, well, maybe you're not entirely fine, but I get what you're saying. Right? Yeah. You were managing to keep the substance under control, but COVID just took the brakes off. The the contain the, the containment. Yeah. That maybe the wheels just fell off. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so there are people who's drinking or drug use just escalated enormously and then the family discord right because then you're stuck at home yeah so it, it was such a difficult period for people with mental health and addiction issues I think that was part of the conversation that I was having with the Baldota family at that time right because that's when we started talking about we really need to do something yeah um, but but I think the upside that has come out of COVID if you can say it's an upside is that there is greater awareness of mental health. It yes. has become now okay to talk about mental health yes. issues. It has become okay now to seek out a therapist. Yeah. I w you know, just to wrap up, and, and I'm sure we'll have another one of these, mm -hmm. one of these in, 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 in the future. We've got a few other people that we're gonna obviously sort of put in that chair <laughs> over, the, over, the coming, <laughs> over the coming months and mm. stuff. And, and um, you know, where, where, where do you sort of see, see things in, in terms of, you know, mental health and, and substance abuse treatment in the next sort of five years in India, you know, I mean, things move quite quickly. What mm -hmm. do you feel? How do you see it in five years? So I'm wildly optimistic. Um, and you're going, you're going to see all modalities, right? You're going to see the traditional rehab centers and the clinical outpatient programs. Yes. You're going to see a lot of online modalities of care. Yes. Uh, I think the Mental Health Act that they passed in 2017 will finally get some teeth. Yes. They will get a lot more strict about regulations. Yes. Which I think is so long overdue. Yeah. About who can call themselves a therapist and who can call themselves a psychologist. Yes. Everything is on paper. It needs yeah. to be enforced. Uh, there is talk about insurance paying for rehab. Yes. All right. So I think in the next five years, it's going to be transformative. Uh, private practitioners will bloom, they will have outpatient clinics opening, you'll have um, rehab centers more like us opening. Sure. And I think we need it, you know. I, I really, really think that we are at this inflection point and if the policies are set right by the government and enforced, yes, we can see a sea change in the way we do mental health care and addiction care in India. Fantastic. Okay, well, thank you very Hopefully. much for your time. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. And I got your name right this time. You got my name right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.